Calling the meeting to order, I'd like to announce the meeting is being recorded. In accordance with 940 CMR 29.10, remote participation adopted by the Greater Lowell Technical School Committee, April 17, 2014. Committeemen O'Hare and Gishner will be participating at tonight's meeting remotely. May we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, sir. Colette, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. LeMay? Here. Mr. Sheehan? Yep. Mr. Gitchier? Lee? 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 Lee, can you hear us? They sit here. Okay. Okay. Mr. Bahu? Here. Mr. Tatis? Here. Mr. Mormon? Yeah. Mr. Mm -hmm. O'Hare? Here. George? Here. Mr. Giggy? Here. Here. Uh, Committeeman LeMay, is there anybody from the public who signed up to speak at today's meeting? <coughs> Negative, Mr. Chairman. All right. On to school committee communications. Are there any? I'm happy to turn this over to the student representative, Thomas, to give his student report. Thank you. Skills USA kicked off the year with school-wide membership meetings for students in all grades and all shops, in addition to staff meetings with the <coughs> Skills USA curriculum integration team members from our technical areas. Our Skills USA freshman program will be continuing this year, and their first meeting last week was well attended by 46 ninth grade students. Their next event will be their annual general membership professional development workshop and pizza party on Wednesday, November 17th, 2021, followed by the Fall State Leadership Conference for Student Officers on the 22nd of November. The National Technical Honor Society and National Honor Society held their induction ceremony on November 10th with parents, staff, and administration in attendance. 57 new members were inducted in the candle lighting ceremony held in the lecture hall. The junior prom was held on Friday, November 12th at Lenzies in Dracut, with 210 juniors in attendance. The junior class planning committee and class advisors wish to thank all of the staff and administration who helped to make this event an, a success. <clears throat> Student Council is holding officer elections this week. In order to run for a position, students must be endorsed by another student council member. After the elections, members will form three committees that will focus on fundraising, events, and volunteer projects. The music club is humming along. While there are many regular attendees, they continue to add students as the word spreads about the club. Members have inventoried the instruments and equipment on hand and have created a wish list of new items to add to their supply. In addition, students are progressing with their individual musical skills and talents and are practicing solo pieces and ensemble work. The Environmental Club continues to work with the custodial staff each week, collecting recycled materials from classrooms. They have also taken over loading paper and recycling the boxes in the Teachers Resource Center every week. The peer tutors are volunteering daily at, in the after-school homework assistance and tutoring program. They are still accepting students to join and welcome the opportunity for underclassmen to get involved. All interested volunteers should contact Mr. Blatus in the school counseling office for more information. Our freshman and sophomore planning committee fundraiser is currently underway. The fundraiser features butter braid breads and joyful traditions cake rolls just in time for the holidays. There are also other items available for purchase, such as popcorn, coffee, tea, and tumblers. Proceeds from the fundraiser will be used to offset costs for future after-school field trips in order to make activities affordable for all students. And from the athletic department, 2021 saw the return of field hockey to Greater Little Tech. The team fielded a solid group of players that competed hard in every contest, finishing with a win in their final game of the season. With the vast majority of the team being freshmen and sophomores, the future looks bright for the Griffin field hockey. The boys and girls soccer teams had tremendous success this fall, as both qualified for the MIAA Division III state tournament. 
Each will also return a number of key players, making the future look bright for the programs. Cross Country wrapped up a successful campaign by hosting the CAC League Meet on October 30th. Both the girls' and boys' teams captured the CAC regular season and League Meet championships. Additionally, the boys' team brought home the state vocational championship, qualified for the MIAA All-State Meet on November 20th. Golf had a great season in their fourth year as a full varsity program. The team secured several match wins and followed that up with solid finishes at the CAC tournament. Girls Volleyball had a successful season, qualifying for the MIAA Division III state tournament. With a solid base of young players, the Lady Griffin should continue their winning ways for seasons to come. The cheer team did a tremendous job this season, placing third at the CAC League competition. The team also qualified for the Division I regional competition on November 14th. And football currently stands at 3-7 and seven on the season, and will look to finish their season strong as they head into their holiday clash with Lowell Catholic on November 24th. The team will return a number of key players next season and should be a force in the CAC for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thomas. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. <clears throat> On to approval of the minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 21st meeting. May I have a second? Second. Roll call, please. Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. On to the report of the treasurer. We have a motion to waive the reading. So moved. A second? Second. All right. Can I have a motion to approve the expenditures of $4,377,334.50? I have a motion. Motion. Second. Second. Can I have a roll call, please? Mr. LeMay? Yes. Mr. Sheehan? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Chatsias? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. O'Hare? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Kiki? Yes. On to the report of general counsel. I don't see him here, so I assume we have none. And now I'd like to turn the meeting over to the superintendent, Joe Davis. Sure, thank you. Uh, the first item on my, on my agenda, I would like to inform the committee that Greater Lowell Tech has been awarded a targeted assistant grant in the amount of $15,000. The grant award will be used to improve outcomes for those subgroups of students who are struggling, ELLs, uh, special education students, as well as our Asian subgroup. The next item is the Cooperative Education Report. I know your report indicates 120 senior students participating in our Cooperative Education Program as, the, as of the end of October. However, I'm happy to report that to date there are 138 senior students participating in co-op, and this represents 27% of the class of 2022. A copy of the report is in your uh, folder. <clears throat> uh, next on my agenda, I would like to provide an update on the general health and safety protocols and practices. On October 26, uh, after consulting with medical experts and state health officials, the Commissioner of Education extended the mask mandate through at least January 15th. The Department of Education will continue to work with medical experts and state health officials to review and consider additional metrics to determine when individuals in schools would no longer be subject to the mask requirement. Uh, we continue here at Greater Low to mark our progress towards the 80% vaccination rate threshold of all students and staff in the school, and we are currently at 27%. Uh, today we began pool testing for those students and staff who have registered. There is a registration form under current alerts as well as on our health and wellness page for those staff and families who are interested in registering for <coughs> our pool testing and test and stay programs. 
Lastly, I'd like to extend my appreciation to our families and staff for continuing to do their part to protect our school community uh, by adhering to the health and safety protocols. And with the holiday season approaching, I would like to ask everyone to please continue to watch for COVID symptoms and signs and to please stay home if you're sick. And lastly, I'd like to wish all of our families and community partners a happy and healthy uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And that, that concludes my report on the health and safety updates here at Greater Law. Uh, my next item on the agenda, I'd like to ask uh, the Director of Curriculum, Instruction and Assessment, Mr. Gregory Haas, to join us to, to, to provide an MCAS performance update. Along with Mr. Haas is our Assistant Superintendent Principal, Mr. Michael Barton. And we all ha also have with us tonight our uh, Math and Science Cluster Chair, Ms. Carol Chisholm, our Director of Special Education, <coughs> Mrs. Allison Rahani, and our direct and our uh, ELE, uh, ELA and Social Studies Clus Cluster Chairperson, uh, Kate Palladino. So we'll begin with Mr. Haas. Good evening. Thank you. So thank you for having us tonight. The um, goal is to talk about the MCAS data from the spring of 2020 administration, excuse me, 2021 administration, um, some kind of highlights, some areas that we can continue to improve with our students, and um, definitely some areas for us to celebrate tonight. Um, in terms of all students overall, um, we did fairly well comparatively. Um, the state of Massachusetts, when they released the scores, identified that Statewide, there was significant loss in learning due to the coronavirus pandemic um, and the remote learning environment that many schools were forced into. Um, math dropped 3% statewide across the board. ELA did have some improvement, um, but you know the good news for us here at Greater Lowell is that across the board, our students did fairly well. Um, we saw a 33%, I'm sorry, we saw a 15% growth in ELA scores, and by growth I mean um, students meeting the exceeding or meeting expectations category. That's kind of the replacement with the new test and the new metrics for advanced or proficient. Um, so we did see growth in that category. We did see a little bit of a decline in math, um, but again the statewide uh, average in math also saw a decline. So we were able to really hold our own in terms of math performance. Science and technology, if you were to compare the 2021 scores to 2019, which was the last administration of MCAS, um, it shows a significant improvement. Um, but I do just want to uh, call out with the testing um, group that was involved in testing this last spring, it was much smaller. It was our honors biology students and some of our um, other students that were more prepared um, after biology one to move forward for the MCAS. And that's due to the department canceling the um, science MCAS requirement for classes up to 2024. Um, so that's a much smaller cohort for that science and technology group, uh, but we did see um, some significant improvement in that area. In terms of our English learners and former English learners, and Ms. Palladino will definitely jump into their growth um, through access shortly, uh, but we did see um, minimal change in English um, but again, when you look in comparison to the state, we are still doing better um, than the state average. You know, we definitely want to see more of that meeting uh, or partially meeting category move into meeting and exceeding. So that's a growth area for us. But um, in terms of reducing the number of students in that not meeting expectations category, we're trying to make some, some movement there. Um, math did take a little bit of a dip. In terms of the performance of English learners and former English learners this year, again, statewide, we know our English learners and students with disabilities fared um, the worst in terms of continuing their education through the pandemic. A lot of English learners lost um, opportunities for them to practice their English as it's not spoken in their home languages and they don't necessarily have the same amount of support. 
uh, and with content, especially in the math and the science areas. Um, so we did see a little bit of a dip there, but we're still fairly well um, in terms of holding our own. Science and technology for us, it's the biology MCAS is what we use here. Um, again, we're still tracking way above the state, um, you know, regardless of the English learner subgroup. Students with disabilities is another area where we saw some improvement in ELA. Um, we're up 2% in the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding expectations. Again, you can see we still have some um, opportunities to move students out of that not meeting expectation category. I'd say school-wide, that's an area where we can grow is to move more and more to the left. So get you know students from the meeting category into exceeding, partially meeting into meeting, um, and so on. Um, so we did see some, uh, you know, growth in terms of students with disabilities in ELA. Uh, math, again, comparable to what we saw statewide where there was a 3% decline. We had a, a small decline in math as well. Science and technology, again, um, because the group of students that participated in the biology MCAS this past June were primarily students coming from our honors program, uh, we didn't have enough students who are on IEPs pr uh, participating in the administration for the department to release subgroup data. It was a small enough group that they suppressed it so that individual students couldn't be identified. So I don't have that to share with you tonight. In terms of our non-disabled students, um, where really saw some major improvement in ELA. We're up 14% in the meeting and exceeding expectations category in ELA. And we were down at 40% in 2019. We're up at 54% now, so that's um, definitely a, a positive improvement. Math, we did see again a slight decline. We dropped 4%, um, but again, when you factor in the statewide drop across the board was at 3%. Um, we, we held our own fairly well, considering our population you know, comes from um, low income, high uh, minority, and, and urban, which tend to have some of the hardest um, opportunities in terms of performance. And science also saw improvement um, in this last administration. Economically disadvantaged is the <coughs> category that the department is using that's kind of replaced low income. Um, and so rather than relying on income metrics, they look for student and family participation in um, different financial assistance programs. So the SNAP program, supplemental nutrition, if they're in the transitional assistance family, if the student's connected to DCF, um, or if the student or the family member is on Medicaid, they are falling into the economically disadvantaged category. Um, so you can see in this category where, again, pretty much on trend with the state across the board in ELA and mathematics, we did go up 15% in ELA from 2019. Math held relatively the same from um, the last administration. And biology definitely saw an improvement again, but we are looking at kind of a different um, cohort with those biology students this year. So the, it's not apples to oranges. Um, our, so there's two subgroups that I'm, I want to call out, and um, Superintendent Director Davis talked briefly about the targeted assistance grant that we received from the Department of Education. In part, that is due to the performance of the Asian subgroup. Um, several years back, the state <coughs> identified that as a group that we could continue to work with as they're falling below their peers at the state level. Um, so once again, this year, our Asian students outperformed all of our other subgroups, uh, but they're still falling below the state threshold in terms of the subgroup performance statewide. And so the department has um, really asked us to emphasize our, our efforts in terms of supporting them. And so the targeted assistance grant um, and definitely working with Ms. Chisholm on the math side is something that um, we hope is going to further support the growth. But again, we did see some improvement in our Asian student cohort. In mathematics, it, the meeting and exceeding expectations categories is up 8%. So we are seeing some of the efforts that Ms. Chisholm um, will kind of talk about and some of the efforts that we've put in over the last two years to support our Asian students in mathematics are coming to fruition. ELA, our Asian student subgroup, um, has got 12% more students meeting and exceeding expectations than they did in 2019. I think it is important to kind of call out that this is only the second year of this new MCAS, the computer-based next generation MCAS. So it's still fairly new and the students in this group would not have tested on a computer in the past. They are you know, still in that transition from when it was paper and pencil test to computer. So there's you know, sometimes um, 
some work in what is the the content area knowledge that they need to gain and what is the technology skills. Um, so we're still working with our students on that, um, giving them more opportunities in class to uh, experiment with the technology platforms, more opportunities to practice the test in the platform that they're going to be using it so that we don't have to worry about um, that coming in and impacting their achievement. Our Hispanic subgroup um, is our next largest one. Um, we did see some gains here again in ELA. We had 18% more students meeting and exceeding the state average than we did in 2019. Math, we have a 3% growth um, compared to where we were in 2019. So that's you know fairly positive seeing that that cohort of students is growing in mathematics when statewide um, there's a decline for that cohort group. And then biology, it was at 58% students that are advanced and proficient um, back in 2019, so we're definitely seeing that there's improvement there. So this slide was not in your packet. We kind of added it um, afterwards. I have a handout that I will give to um, Ms. Evans and she can share it with you. Um, this just kind of is a, a highlight of some of the areas where we saw some more significant gains in some areas where we were able to now dig in and kind of um, do an analysis of what worked and what we did um, strategically that allowed for these improvements for students um, to kind of continue that into this next year's administration of MCAS. Um, so again, you can see in ELA, our overall um, percentage of students in exceeding and meeting expectations is up 15%. We saw improvements in our students with disabilities cohort, our economically disadvantaged cohort, our Asian cohort, our Hispanic cohort. Um, they definitely have seen significant growth and our economically disadvantaged and Hispanic cohorts have outperformed the state average, um, which is something that is new for us. So, um, you know, congratulations to Kate and her English teachers and their hard work and the hard work of our students, especially coming out of the pandemic. Um, in mathematics, we're also seeing some growth. Our English learners and our former English learner cohort outperform the state average. Um, our Asian cohort, which is you know kind of the one that we struggle with the most in terms of the, the attention from the Department of Education, that had an 8% growth. Um, Hispanic cohort is up and has met the state average as has economically disadvantaged. Um, and again, our biology scores, they're a little skewed just because of the, uh, the participants in the June administration, but we really um, had some really significant gains <coughs> in terms of, of that. And I know that that's been a focus of Greater Lowell Tech um, for a few years now is to improve the biology and the science curriculum that our students are exposed to. So we're definitely seeing some yield in, of all of the efforts that have been put in so far. Well, we do have some areas we can celebrate. There are still some areas that we can continue to improve. Um, working with Mr. Barton and Ms. Davis, Ms. Chisholm, Ms. Palladino, Ms. Riani, um, we've kind of had some conversations on where we can go from here. I'm going to actually turn it over to um, Kate and Carol to talk about ones that are more specific to their programs. I'll actually start with you. Good evening. Um, so one of the things that we're focusing on right now is a clearer alignment between English and social studies in terms of the standards. We noticed last year when we looked at the data, the English department and as well as the social studies department, that our students were really struggling in the area of writing. So we wanted to align a little bit more closely together so we could provide more authentic opportunities for our students to practice different types of writing that they could see. Um, we are also in the English department focusing on embedding literacy strategies and working in conjunction with our literacy action team to come up with different ways and how can we put, that, uh, put those ideas into the classroom. New this year, we have ELA tutors that are, going, are providing real-time tier one interventions. I have very, I'm very fortunate to have three tutors located upstairs in the library, and they can be reserved for either writing support in the classroom, <coughs> or they can students can be pulled out to work on something that they may have missed, or something that they can be, be taught. And expanded. We have expanded ELA MCAS prep offered after school and during school vacations weekends prior to MCAS. We ran one, uh, went for five sessions. We had, um, I believe, six or seven students continuous, uh, cont uh, attend continuously. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they do. Ms. Chisholm? Yeah. So in mathematics, we have embedded more foundational skills into the Algebra 1 area. 
So we have a double period of algebra for students that need more support. Um, we also have a pre-algebra uh, to help a lot of our EL students uh, also gain the vocabulary along with the uh, math concepts. Um, most of our groups did uh, still lag behind the state scores, so we introduced a new mathematic curriculum this year. Um, it is across the board from pre-algebra straight through algebra honors. So all of the students are using the same curriculum. Uh, some are more in depth, some <coughs> sections more in depth than others. Uh, last summer, we did a vertical alignment because one of the things we needed to close were the gaps from going from one class to the other. Uh, we need to make sure where the ninth grade courses end, the tenth grade courses uh, begin for a smooth transition. So we did a full vertical alignment straight through calculus. Uh, one area we noticed uh, that was uh, neglected uh, the way our curriculum was written was probability and statistics. It is now embedded into the geometry curriculum every day uh, to close those learning gaps since many of the uh, standards have been um, risen. One of the have been made higher for probability and statistics, yet it didn't fit in any particular course. So we have it in our embedded in geometry every single day. Uh, we have two math tutors for tier one intervention. Uh, they are available to work with students one-on-one -on -one, or they can go into the classroom to uh, help on any specific day. Um, <coughs> we have also uh, just finished our expanded MCAS prep, which we offer it after school to prepare our students for the exam that they took last week. And we had two teachers involved, and it was optional for students to come. What was interesting is that this was our, our junior students. So these, uh, these were juniors, not a uh, normal sophomore cohort. Uh, for biology, we have implemented a new curriculum uh, through Project Lead the Way for our students who take biology over two years. Um, it is a Project Lead the Way is all hands-on and it is tied to the new frameworks. So the students who will take the exam this year, there's a cohort of them who will be under the new program. Um, you know, one other piece with the mathematics connected to the TAG grant, the Targeted Assistance Grant, is a math curriculum team that's going to be meeting next week for the first meeting. And they're really going to be digging into the math standards and the math results to see if we can do any more analysis. I mean, the challenge for our teachers and our students is you have a set of frameworks that, you know, say there's 100 standards, and you never know which one the state is going to pull um, to assess students on on the MCAS. So it's really making sure that we're um, exposing students to the full scope of what could be happening. So that's work that's going to be starting very soon. Um, you know, it's a great teacher leadership opportunity, and I'm excited to see where that leads us. Um, one other area school-wide, um, really kind of taking the, the heavy academic factor out of it, but we're going to be having a curriculum data team, which will be starting, I believe it's the first meeting is mid-December. And they're going to be looking at factors that may be outside of standard course performance. Um, what does attendance play, you know, as a role in this? What does socioeconomic standard um, socioeconomic status rather play um, in terms of student achievement. So we're going to be looking at some other factors as well to see how we can further support students. And lastly, I did just want to reference um, our overall accountability. Um, the Department of Ed, due to the pandemic, has not released accountability for the second year now in a row. So the accountability that is still attached to Griddle Tech is from 2019, which was not requiring assistance or intervention at that point. Um, so we're still kind of holding firm there due to the, the pandemic, and um, it has given us some opportunity to really dig in and make some of the um, changes and, and see some of the growth play out that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So lastly, on the agenda, I'd like to ask uh, the ELA, ELE, and Social Studies uh, Cluster Chairperson, and Ms. Kay Palladino to join us to provide uh, an EL program update. <coughs> Good evening. So today's presentation is discussing the EL program overview, and I'm also going to discuss our access scores, which is the state uh, state summative assessment for EL students. Okay, so currently in our program right now, we have 199 students, and the majority of our students tested uh, are now in the advanced level. Uh, the graph on your left is where we test other, our students tested last year, and as you can see in the middle, most of our students tested in intermediate, <coughs> and this year we jumped over into the advanced column. Here at Greater Global Technical High School, we have three levels. Basic is for students who are at a lower level. There's a scale of six. A basic student would score in between one and two, intermediate three and four, advanced five and six. So um, this the, we have a lower number of students in the program this year. We had 43 students FLEP, which is stands for formerly limited, limited English proficient, which means they exited the program. Last year we were at 226. So what we have here are these are the 2021 access results by grade. Um, so I've created a, a graph, uh, like a a chart of where the students tested in last year and where they are now. So the proficiency level entering and emerging are levels one and two that corresponds with the basic. Th developing and expanding corresponds with intermediate. <clears throat> Bridging and reaching corresponds with advanced. So we have for ni our ninth graders, 33% made progress towards their benchmarks, which is to exit the program. And that's up from 29% in 2020. Um, we do have, although less than last year, we do have some students who are testing into base basic, but in order to exit the program, you need to have, a student needs to reach 3.9 in literacy, which is 50% reading and 50% writing, and then a 4.2 overall, which is 35% reading, 35% writing, 15% listening, and 15% speaking. So a lot of our freshmen tested into expanding and bridging, which is a big jump from where they were last year. These are, these are the 10th graders, and again, 15% made progress towards their benchmark, which is a little bit of a dip last, uh, in 2020. They, we had a score, it was 21%. And again, more kids tested into bridging and reaching levels overall. And we have more kids who are testing into intermediate, which is developing and expanding. So when you're looking at these charts, it says it's the number of students at that level and then the percent total tested in 2021 and then the percent total tested in 2020. So it's really exciting for the program that we've got more students testing into the intermediate and advanced level. So these are our, our juniors, 16% made progress towards exiting the program, and that's an increase from 2020, which is when it, it was an 8%. And again, our, the junior scores are interesting because there's not, there's not one domain that has more students testing into it. It's all, uh, it's all across the board that they have, that they're testing into, uh, that they're testing into at the different levels. It's not one that they're standing out at, so just an interesting split. And our seniors, so we had a little dip here, but 6% made progress, and it's a decrease from 7% in 2020. We have mo more students that tested into the intermediate level. We had, did have a chunk of students that tested into the entering and emerging level. So areas of growth, 
again, like I said before, we had 43 students who flopped up from 25 students last year. It's a 60% increase. We have some positive movement in both the intermediate, <clears throat> developing and expanding, and the advanced, bridging and reaching categories in specific domains. For our students, it's predominantly reading and listening. Uh, our goal as an ELE department is to work on the speaking and the writing. We've got two department goals this year. One is coming up with more authentic opportunities to practice, practice authentic, uh, authentic speaking, like as in academic conversations and what they might see on the access. And then in terms of writing, again, practicing how can we connect in with other cross-curricular, <coughs> more social studies, science, so we can practice writing across the curriculum. And again, I do have some Several members of my EL department are on the literacy action team with me, so they're providing an interesting perspective there as well. Our EL dropout rate decreased, so that's always very exciting. So areas of improvement. We do have some upper our upperclassmen students who are in levels one and two, our basic students have made minimal progress. And some of our long-term EL students, mostly our sophomores and juniors, are not moving out of the intermediate level. A long-term EL student is a student who's been in the program for more than six years. So when we are looking at our EL curriculum for the intermediate level, we're trying to come up with more engaging ways to get the students, to reach the students, what, what's working, what's not. We're having a lot of different conversations around around that and how can we make sure that we're, those specific students are getting what they need. Our current freshmen right now, we have 21 students who are in advanced, 14 are in intermediate, nine are in basic, and six have left the program. We spend a lot of time in the EL department utilizing the data and trying to come up with best practices and really coming up with targeted interventions for our kids. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank you at the end. You're welcome. <laughs> I guess we're on to the business manager. <clears throat> All right, good evening. I have just one agenda item for you tonight, but it is a, uh, I guess, a bigger one, and that's the approval of a new FY22 budget. Um, so when the state finalized their budget in July, there were some pretty significant changes, particularly around funding. Um, we got more funding from the state, um, which is always welcome. Um, however, in, do, in that process, it also changes the minimum local contributions required from all of our member communities to make up their portions. Um, so in an effort, um, and in that, there were increases to the assessment for Dunstable and Drakeit. Um, so as an effort to offset this, what we were able to do was use the funds, the additional funds that were provided for or estimated in the state budget for the reimbursement of transportation as well as the money that we had moved into our transportation revolving account at the end of last year from the excess reimbursement we received from the state. This allowed us to leave the assessments across the board for all member communities equal or at a reduction so that we didn't have to go back and ask them to reapprove budgets um, in their own municipalities due to the change in the, the state funding formula. Um, I provided uh, some details about a line by line of every change that was made to the budget and some reasoning. Um, so in the time that we had approved our first budget last March through um, this November, we settled most of our union contracts. So we were able to increase the salary lines to be appropriate to what they will be actually through this year. Um, we also were able to get a better estimate on our health insurance um, and other um, costs within the budget. Um, so there were a, a whole mess of different changes within the budget. Um, I would say the vast majority were really related to the contract increases or having new hires that we now knew what the salaries were going to be, retirees um, replaced by incoming staff, those types of things. Um, and beyond the actual expenditure and revenue changes I provided in the budget, I also did show you a recap of the assessment um, on a change on a 
a basis of the change from the originally approved budget to where we are today. Um, <clears throat> so you would be able to see if you went to the um, second or third page of the what's called the tab five that I included in the back, you'd be able to see all of the changes that were made, which will include a, a decrease in assessment to Drake it of about eighty thousand um, dollars, a level fund or a level assessment to the town of Dunstable, so the no change there, uh, a reduction in our assessment to Lowell by about three hundred and forty seven thousand dollars, and a reduction in our assessment to um, Tingsboro by about ninety four hundred dollars. <throat> Um, so overall, with the increase in the state budget and then the decreases to the assessments, uh, along with the increase to the transportation reimbursement, our budgets actually decreased by $37,222 from what was approved back in March. Now, that's not to say that any services were cut. It was just taking advantage of other revenues that were provided and using revenues that we had. So nothing was actually removed from the budget. It was just being able to recognize revenue um, differently and... Um, or, um, to maintain the budget based on the new information we had from the state. Um, and I included a lot more um, detail in the package, but that's the, uh, the, the short, short version. <laughs> Any questions? I think it's fantastic about the uh, working with the assessments there, so nobody else can, uh, just didn't go up to everybody. That's, that's good stuff. That's yeah, it's, it's tough when we approve our budget before the state right. does. Um, we never really know what's going to come out in July, and in years past, we've been able to mitigate it or it hasn't affected the assessments to the member communities. Um, this year, it went up, um, and it might, um, I mean, we were lucky in the sense that we did have excess transportation mm -hmm. revenue last year that we were able to set aside into that revolving account to make <coughs> this happen. Um, otherwise, we would have had to reduce the budget um, at a much greater rate, um, probably about another 200000 which then would potentially impact services in, in what we had within our budget. Um, so this might be something that we revisit come this budget cycle in March yeah. um, to, um, you know, I, I don't like to include some sort of a contingency or anything within a budget, but it, I think it would be helpful to maybe even have just a minimal contingency in there so that if minimum local contribution does increase um, to any one particular community, we would be able to offset that um, when July hits and the state budget is finalized. Yeah. Um, something I'll look at. I'm not sure. I don't have it all worked out in my head just, just yet, but um, or what that dollar figure would look like because, like I said, this year it would have been, I mean, we would have had to have a, a pretty substantial contingency in there to make up. It was roughly about a $200,000 difference that we were able to use from that transportation revolving account. Um, I don't want to write that much maybe into the budget as a contingency, but something maybe to offset might be might be in order and inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And you'll keep working on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I'm gonna have to dig into a little bit more, try to see how well I could project our uh, foundation enrollment and what that might look like from an assessment standpoint to the communities. Um, it's tough because the state does produce a lot of these numbers and a lot of the data we don't even have available to us, such as um, the economic impact of, um, they do it based on housing and um, income wealth within each community, and those get redone every year as well. We don't get that until the state comes out with it. And um, to be frank, it's it's a very complicated formula. I'm not sure I could get to it, even if I had the raw data myself. Uh, I might be able to get close, but not perfect anyway. Um, but those are some of the things I'm going to be looking at coming into the next budget cycle, just so that if we end up in this scenario again, that hopefully we'll have um, the ability to maintain assessment and not ask communities to be revoting all of their budgets mid-year. Mm. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for your diligence. Now we do Can need I a vote for the, to approve the F22 budget as presented by Mike. I'll make the motion. Second. And Colette, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. LeMay? Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Kitchier? <clears throat> yes, I'm on such a delay. Put me yes, last motion. I'm pretty sure I missed it. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Tatsius? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. O'Hia? <coughs> George? Mr. Giggy? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. On any old business, do we have anything there? Do we have anything under new business? 
I didn't see any committee men motions. I guess we're on to the report of the subcommittees. There are none. And now I need a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy, strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, which I do, administrators. I don't think there'll be any votes afterwards either. Second. Yeah. And can I have a roll call? Mr. Sheehan? Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Morin? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. Can you adjourn? Can I have a motion to adjourn then? So motion. Second? Yeah. Roll call. Mr. Sheehan. Yes. Mr. Gitchia? Yes. Mr. Bahu? Yes. Mr. Tatsias? Yes. Mr. Warren? Yes. Mr. Gigi? Yes. <clears throat>